challenge you guys to look at this from two perspectives. Because I see two perspectives. There are multiple perspectives here, but I see two really key perspectives as we look at being a servant leader, okay? A lot of times when I read it, I look, oh, well, I'm one of the 72 others, you know, and I'm going out. That's one perspective. But what does it look like if you look at it from the perspective of the people who were not receptive? What can you learn if you put yourself in that situation and you are the one that is not receptive to the 72? What do you learn about servant leadership through that example, okay? So look at it from multiple perspectives. I think a lot of times we insert ourselves into the story as the hero, um, and, and we can learn something from that, but what does it look like when we insert ourselves in the story from a different perspective? So what do you learn about servant leadership from both sides of that? You guys talk about that. Well, from my neighbor's perspective, I learned that the preparation is important to stay focused on serving. Like, I didn't see do not take a purse or bag or sandals as anything that could be influential. But then when I heard her perspective, it's like that stuff will, you know, send us off course or we'll get, you know, caught up with money or possessions or that kind of thing. And I'm easily swayed off course, so thank you. <laughs> that there could be distractions in that, yeah. 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 It's going to take time because he sent people out ahead of him to look at what the harvest will provide, but the harvest is going to take time. Mm -hmm. So you know that whatever you're going to go do, it's not going to be something you go in and do fast. Yeah. It's going to take you some time because you've got to change people's hearts. 
Absolutely. So it's going to take time because you're changing hearts, not just outward behaviors, but you're ta changing internal motivation. If you don't change hearts, you, it's, it's going to be like uh, seeds falling on rocky ground. It's not going to take root. Yeah. And are you guaranteed a beautiful reception wherever you go? No. No, no you're not. You definitely are not. That there are going to be times that it takes a long time because of the what we're doing is what God is doing is changing people's hearts um, and their attitudes and their motivations. Planting what, seeds. Planting seeds for sure. What um, what do you guys learn from the people who did not receive those that Jesus sent out? What do you what do you learn from their example? Uh, could could it be that? Uh, they were expecting Jesus himself to come in that time and not the servants. Mm. Could be. Could and be. therefore they rejected the, the servant. Oh, we want the big guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do we learn from that as we have other people that are coming in and influencing us? I think a lot of times we think of ourselves as more of the leader than the servant, but then we are all put in this situation where we have the opportunity to influence other people, but guess what? Other people are influencing us. We need to be open. Absolutely. That we need to be open. We need to be open to the influence of others simultaneously while we are influencing others. That there is this beautiful, that's how the body of Christ works. That Nick is teaching me things, I'm teaching Nick things. And Mike is teaching me things, and I'm teaching Mike things. And we are influencing each other in different areas. And, and sometimes we can get caught up with our own leadership that we forget that we are servant leaders, that we are called to be learners and selfless and giving and supporting, as well as doing some of these other more leadership kind of qualities in influencing. With, with one of the, the persons that I've been witnessing to for a very long time, we went to high school together, I had to finally say he has the right to say no. He doesn't have to say yes. You know, because it's put before him to accept or not, and he chooses repeatedly not to, but he has the right to say no. And even when these people say no to me, it doesn't mean that when Mike comes behind me two weeks later and, ex and extends the invitation to them that they won't say yes to Mike. And, and as, a, as a servant leader, we need to be willing to say, you know what, it's not all about me. It's not all about that person accepting me. It's about seeing ourselves as co-ministers together in what we are doing, as co-servant leaders together, and we are all influencing together. And so if it doesn't go well for me, that doesn't mean it's not going to go well for Nick. Nick's, Nick needs to continue on, and he needs to continue on influencing. And, um, and there might be an opportunity for that person to receive something from somebody else. But it's also very important in, in that moment of rejection or whatever, how you authentic, authenticate the message you are trying to put out. Mm -hmm. Because if you react in a negative way, then you just undermine everything you're trying to do. Yeah. But if you still maintain dignity and grace through the whole situation, then when whomever comes behind you, you've already been planted. Influence yeah. that seed of absolutely, yeah. yeah. And you, even in that moment, you're right. You're using that super so superpower of leadership for good or for evil. How are you going to respond to that? Um, and you plant the seed as to um, as to how they receive the next person that comes along. Um, so good insights for sure on servant leadership from that passage, looking at it from both, uh, from both points of view. The next thing that we're going to do is move on to page 9, and we are going to talk about what servant leadership is and what servant leadership isn't um, as we continue to really define the difference between those two things. Because really this is, um, this is not only the core of leadership training, but it's the core of discipleship. It's who we are as followers of Christ. As a follower of Christ, we have influence. And how do we use that influence in a way that spreads the gospel and shares that with other people? So we're going to just kind of hit a whole list of different things that we're going to kind of contrast and talk about. 
Um, the first one is that servant leadership is cooperation. It is not competition. Um, I hope you guys were paying attention when Nita started talking about the, the fact that this is a connectional church. Um, because I think a lot of times we think about our church, meaning the people inside our building. And we think about our church in that context, and we think about the people that are not outside the building, and how we have all these churches that are competing to get those people, right? Because it's all about numbers and who has the most people inside their building. It's not. It's not a competition. What if we actually saw ourselves in the United Methodist Church as just campuses of one big church? And then if the church that I go to within these walls is not a fit for you, that's fine. Let me help you find a church that is. Because we were not called to be all things to all people in each individual worship setting. There are so many beautiful worship settings that are available. What would it look like if we as servant leaders thought about cooperation instead of competition? And what if we took that outside the United Methodist Church and we said, you know what, we're not even in competition with the Baptists. Are you kidding me right now? What would that look like if we worked within denominations, if we thought of, if we saw ourselves as one church in our communities and began saying, hey, how can we work together to do this? How can we work together to influence the people in our communities that are far from Christ? What would that look like? That would be beautiful. That's what servant leaders do. They think cooperation and not competition. Did you guys know that sometimes this even happens within ministry areas in our churches? Um, I was doing a, a volunteer workshop, um, leadership workshop for a group of people at a church. And I said, um, let's set some expectations right up front. You, I need you guys to let me know what are the things that you want me to hit in this workshop. First thing. So they raised their hand and they said, I want you to tell her to stop recruiting my people. And I'm like, whoa, okay, we'll address that. Sometimes there's this competition for people and resources even within our ministry areas within our four walls, right? And what would it look like even within our, our church walls if we thought cooperation instead of competition? That these are the people that God has called us to serve across lots of ministry areas. And if the ministry area that I am in charge of is not something that you need to serve at, let me help you find one that you can plug into. Because I'm more concerned about your spiritual growth and development than whether or not I have all the spaces on my schedule filled in for my volunteers or whatever it is. So servant leadership is cooperation, not competition. Servant leadership is we, and it's not me. It's not about me. It's about all of us working together as the body of Christ. Servant leadership is both and, not either or. A lot of times when we get this leader mentality a little bit out of sync and pulled away from the servant mentality, we think that it is my way. We think that we know the right answer and that and our certainty blinds us from seeing other perspectives and other points of view. Just like when we read that passage and we kind of put ourselves in the mindset of the hero, a lot of times when we are leading, we put ourselves in the mindset of the expert or the hero that knows all the things and knows how it needs to be done. And so we say, it's, it's either this or it's this. It's all or it's nothing. And it's my way or it's your way. And there's no compromising. But if I have my choice, I'm going to tell you that my way is right. Um, but what would it look like if as servant leaders we said, what would it look like to, in, to integrate multiple points of view and to say, hey, so let me hear your perspective and let me pull out all of the good things that you are saying, all of the key, the essence of what you're saying, and let's pull out the essence of what I'm saying, and let's figure out what does that look like together? Because I think when we implement all or nothing situations, when we implement this or this, 
we only get and attract people and minister to people who are at this end of the spectrum or this end of this of the spectrum when really if we're able to say through compromise and through discussion and through perspective taking if we're able to look at all of those things we're able to come out with a result that may not look what I look like something I had intended but it reaches even more people because it's not just this extreme or this extreme it's all of those things put together in this beautiful way so think about both and instead of either or servant leadership is long-term investment which is what you were talking about Andy versus short-term success long-term investment um, long-term improvement means investment it means that we're in it for the long haul and here's the thing that I think we sometimes make the mistake of thinking is that I need to do the things that I need to do now because I'm here now I may not be here a year from now so let's go ahead and just do the things now that give me immediate success and give me immediate approval if I'm honest that's where it kind of comes in a lot is hey this is the situation I know that we need to move here in the future and and this is only a, a, a short-term success that may not even take us to the future but but I got these people breathing down my back and they're not really happy with me so I'm just gonna do what they want and take that next short short step and sometimes that short step is in pursuit of a long-term goal and that's great if it is but if your short-term step is just I'm gonna take that one step and stop or I'm gonna take this one step that leads me in a different direction because it allows me to experience the approval of people that I'm working with then we're missing out on that long-term investment. Long-term is hard because you're changing people's minds, you're changing people's motivations. But I think that's what we're going to do. Because even when I step out of my role, the next person's gonna come in and continue the work that I, that I started. And continue the work that I continued from the person that I received it from. This is an ongoing investment in people. And we need to make sure that we are pursuing the long-term goal and the long-term improvement instead of just stopping short at things that give us temporary successes and temporary approval of people. Servant leadership is people over positions. Um, here at the chapel, one of the phrases that we use a lot is that jobs are tools to get people done. Um, people are not tools to get jobs done, but jobs are tools to get people done. And what that means is that positions are important because they are tools for people to grow spiritually. So it's not that the task is more important than the person. The person is more important than the task. And how can we see all of our ministry opportunities as ways for people to use the gifts that God has given them and to help develop them so they become more important than the actual task and the job that they're doing. Servant leadership is motivation over meeting. How many times have you guys said, well, we should probably have another meeting? <laughs> right? We think, oh, it's time for this other meeting. What would it look like if as servant leaders we say, Oh my gosh, it's time for us to motivate people to the next step that we're called to do. Let's get together and talk about what that is. Not, it's time for us to have another meeting. Because when you walk into it as a servant leader saying, hey, it's time for us to get together to be re-energized, to be motivated, to figure out what we're called to do, and to get the strength that we need to move forward. Oh man, what, is, what do your meetings look like when that is on the agenda? When your whole agenda is planned because of the opportunity to motivate, not just the fact that it's the third Sunday of the month, so we need to have another meeting, right? Man, that's a big difference. So servant leadership is servanthood, not entitlement. It's not about what I deserve or what I have earned or what I've worked hard for. It's about servanthood. Servant leadership is can, not can't. Um, a lot of times we use I can't do it as justification, justification for apathy and inactive, inactivity. Um, that's 
what happens a lot. We say, well, I can't do that. And I would encourage you guys, as servant leaders, to ask the question, really? Because when you ask the question, really, when you say I can't, when you think I can't, or when someone else says we can't, then you're saying, you know what, let's challenge that assumption. Because it could be that you really can't. There are genuine limitations that somebody says you cannot do this. Or you have genuine limitations of, um, you know, I want to go out and I want to spend $100,000 and your budget is $2 and you say I can't. But here's the thing. But you can do something. And so as servant leaders, we are called to question the can'ts and we're called to say, really? Why? And we're called to get to the essence and figure out, okay, but I can do this. Um, one of the things that we make a habit of here at the chapel is we do this kind of play on words. Whenever we say here and I can't, or whenever we say and I can't, we say, but I can do whatever it is. Because there are real limitations. There are things that we can't do. But I think there are always going to be things, if God is calling us to do something, that he's given us ways to do it. And sometimes it takes a little creativity on our part. It takes us thinking in a different avenue. It takes us thinking in a different way, seeing things from a new point of view. And then all of a sudden, we're able to see the possibilities, even in the midst of the can'ts. That those can'ts become kind of the boundaries within where, which we are able to be creative and spurs us on to be creative instead of just seeing those as roadblocks for inactivity and, and apathy. So servant leadership is can, not can't. Servant leadership is focusing on health, not growth. Now here's the thing. I do think growth is really important. But do you guys know that healthy things grow? <laughs> so growth happens, but when we focus on growth, you can have unhealthy things that grow as well as healthy things grow. Now unhealthy things that grow, they don't tend to last very long, do they? Because they're unhealthy. So you can focus on the growth and you can get people here, but if you're not focusing on health, then that's not going to be lasting impact. And remember, we said that we're in it for the long-term improvement, right? So we need to focus on health, not growth. And if we focus on health, then guess what? The growth is gonna happen. But it's where we put our focus as leaders. Uh, servant leadership is steps, not a quick fix, which we kind of, um, which we kind of talked about. Steps is all about transformation, and a quick fix is more about conforming. Okay, so we can choose as we're leading other people, we can choose to have them conform to what we want them to do, or we can take slow down and take them through the process of transformation. So they choose to do what God is calling them to do. A lot of times we want the quick fix, right? Because we say, just do what I want you to do. One of the things that, um, that I tell my kids all the time, I'm a big question asker. So when they come to me, I don't ever want to just like tell them the answer. I want to teach them how to think. I don't want to tell them what to think. I want to teach them how to think. And so they'll come to me with an issue and then I'll say, really? Well, have you thought about this? Or why do you think you're feeling that way? And I have about 10 different questions that just come out of my mouth. And they're like, would you just tell me what to do? And I'm like, no. And it's because, yes, I could tell them what to do, make them do it, and they would conform to whatever I said to do. But what's more beautiful is when I ask them the question, I walk with them through that process of having that transformation in their life, and then they choose to do what God's calling them to do. And that's what we're called to do as servant leaders. Help people think steps, not a quick fix. Um, servant leadership is discovery, not declaration. We want people to own their own faith, to discover what God is calling them to do. We don't want to just tell people what to do. We want to make sure that we're providing environments for them to encounter God on their own. And a lot of times, for those of us who are in leadership positions, we do a lot more telling than we do offering opportunities for discovery. 
And sometimes I think as leaders, especially those who have any kind of communication um, in, in our job description, um, we tell way too much and we give way too little time over to the Spirit for Him to tell them the things that He would want them to know. And so, and so we need to be thinking about discovery and opportunities for people to discover versus declaration. Servant leadership is collaboration over independence, which you guys pointed out in that last passage um, that you noticed that God sent them two by two. Instead of thinking, how can I get this job done with fewer people? What would it look like if we said, how can we get this job done with two or more people? And inviting more people into that opportunity. And I get it. I have often said to myself, it'd be easier if I just did this myself. Right? And truth of the matter is, it probably would be easier if I just did that myself. If I'm only doing it the way that I think it needs to be done. But then that limits my influence and it limits my ability to reach out to multiple groups of people. And it limits God's ability to be used and, and, and um, declared through the lives of other people. So we need to be thinking about collaboration and how do we work with large groups of people to get multiple viewpoints in here instead of just thinking about how can I do this and what am I called to do. And then finally, um, oh, no, it's not finally. It's finally on my sheet. Um, we need to be thinking servant leadership is change over comfort. Change over comfort. We're not called to be comfortable. Do you guys know um, one of the things, another mom-ism that I've said to my kids is God cares more about your character than your comfort. Mm. And man, that is so, so true in my life. It's hard to hear. And it's hard to be on the receiving end of. Um, but God really does care more about our character than our comfort. And I think a lot of times we try to protect that comfort um, when God is saying, hey, get out of your comfort zone so I can develop your character. Because that character development doesn't really happen when we're comfortable. Um, we need to think about unity instead of being right. Did you guys know that every time you walk away from a situation feeling like a winner, you've just created a loser? Man, when we walk away from a discussion or a debate and we're like, man, I nailed it. That was so good. I had just the right point. I won. You are leaving behind some losers in that situation. And that is definitely not being the servant part of a servant leader. So we need to be thinking about unity and how to bring all people together instead of just being right. We need to think about authenticity versus avoidance. How many of you guys have noticed the elephant in the room? Me. And you guys are like, why does Anne have an elephant in the room, correct? Mm -hmm. This guy sits underneath my desk in my office. And he just sits there. He's just the elephant in the room. And his presence there reminds me to always ask myself, what is the elephant in the room? And to have the courage to step into those awkward places to talk about the elephant in the room. Because a lot of times as leaders, and particularly depending on your personality style, I know for me, I would much rather avoid a conflict or a confrontation than I would address that in a loving way, head on direct way. This guy right here reminds me we need to talk about the elephant in the room. That's how we get authentic. That's how we get real with each other. And we become vulnerable and we say, hey, I don't know, this is what's going on, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm sensing, there are things happening, it's uncomfortable to talk about, but let's talk about the elephant in the room. So we need to be thinking about authenticity versus avoidance. We need to be thinking about walking with people instead of sink or swim. Um, how many of you guys have ever equipped or empowered somebody to do something? Raise your hand. Do you guys know that there is a way to equip and empower somebody to do something that makes them feel like you are for them and walking with them? And there's a way to do that that makes them feel like it's sink or swim. And how you equip and empower people makes all the difference in the world 
as to how they are going to be able to learn and grow from this experience. So one of the best ways to walk with people is when you are empowering and equipping someone, you say, hey, watch me as I do this. And you invite them to watch. And then you say, you know what, now that you've watched me do this one time, let's do this together. So you kind of share that experience. And then after you share that experience, then you say, now you do it and I'm gonna watch you. And then once they're able to do that, and it goes really well, then you say, you got this. But I think a lot of times we say, my job is to equip and empower, so I'm gonna give you all these things and I'm gonna walk away and God has given you everything you need to do that task. And you're like, I think what I need is a mentor. <laughs> um, and I think that mentor is you. So we need to make sure that we are walking with people, not allowing them to sink or swim. And finally, the last one is to listen and not dictate. So as you guys look at that big long list, I'm going to give you guys the ability to be authentic with each other. And just to share, what are the two areas that you struggle with the most in your servant leadership? Is it the mindset, hey, it's easier to do it myself? Is it that that's, uh, searching for independence or that need for independence? Is it, um, I really want to be right all the time. Like, I know what I'm saying is right, and I just, I really struggle with that. What is it for you? What are the two areas that you really struggle with the most? Share that with the people at your table.